So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Igor Blažević. I'm the head teacher at the very small educational non-government organizations in Myanmar called Educational Initiatives. So we are now in an uh, extraordinary beautiful uh, library of the Anglo-American uh, uh, University and it's my real pleasure to be together with uh, uh, Alexei Anasin. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us here. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, the uh, dynamic of the relations between the mass protests and the uh, 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 reaction of the security forces, military forces. That's it. Yeah, th thank you for uh, coming and I'm uh, delighted to be here. So let's start with uh, with uh, really kind of the some of the basic terminology. Uh, how do you will define what is the end game? Yeah, I'll uh, get to that. I want to just also thank you for this opportunity. It, it is an extraordinary situation in the country under attention and um, in the world. An end game situation is where you have a government or an incumbent regime that is pinned against an opposition. It is the last point at which a struggle tends to manifest. It's a point in which there's been protests for many months, and it's a situation in which last minute decisions get made and often revolution either succeeds or fails during this time period. And in Myanmar, I think that is what we are currently uh, witnessing. Then uh, the next question will be, if we are talking about uh, 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 shifting the loyalty of the security forces, uh, uh, how you will describe what is the soft defection and what is the hard defection? Yeah, so this is a, a definition that was made in a recent study by Croissant and, and colleagues, and um, it is not a universally uh, utilized definition, but a soft form of defection is when security forces would simply not respond to an order to repress protesters, or they would stay in their barracks. A hard form of defection is the launching of a coup. And in uh, Myanmar, we saw that in February of, the, of this year. So there already has been a hard form of defection. And uh, you now have this uh, military-led government, and new opportunities for soft forms of defection can arise. And I think uh, recent, literally recent weeks, we've seen um, soft forms of defections already starting to occur. Will it be possible to give some a concrete example uh, of uh, the end game uh, in which we have a mass protests uh, and then uh, the shift of the loyalty of the military uh, forces happened? Uh, how it happened, why it happened? Well, I'll start uh, close to home here, 1989, Czechoslovakia. Uh, in in, uh, in face of mass protests, the military went out on uh, television and said, we're not responding to these protests with threat. Uh, that protest was very large. Half a million people were out here on the, on the streets of Prague. Uh, more recently, I mean, we've had um, the uh, second people power revolution in the Philippines. That was uh, one incident. And in, in general, um, th this phenomenon uh, happens during the end game situation. Uh, the, the drawback is that on a general level, uh, there's still very little conclusive evidence about why it actually happens then, mm -hmm. right? Because you have large numbers of cases in which it happened and other cases in which it did not happen. So it, it's a difficult thing to predict, and I would say it's an incredibly difficult yeah. thing. And what about, but we can probably, let's say, talk about certain factors mm -hmm. which we have identified that are usually playing in the game. Sure, sure. So, so, so what are these kind of the five uh, complex setup factors which are contributing to that? Um, in my personal um, inquiry on these topics, ut utilizing data uh, from hundreds of years in total of opposi opposition activity, um, I found that the size of the opposition movement was important. So 100,000 or more people was one of the variables, both violent and nonviolent strategy perhaps um, exclusively or non-exclusively, uh, state bureaucratic defection. So when members of the government uh, walk out on the government and join the protesters, uh, repression backfire in cases in which you have protesters get repressed and the incident doesn't stop protest, that could lead to defection. And in my own research, I've found that it's combinations of these different factors that can bring about the, the outcome of defection. Now, um, perhaps the uh, 
way in which my research differs from kind of prior work was that prior work tended to only view nonviolence as one of these kind of sufficient factors that needs to be in place uh, alongside other factors to bring about the outcome. But I found that uh, it's not necessarily the case. Uh, for example, I identified five different pathways uh, through which defections occurred across around 800 years in total of opposition activity uh, from the years 1946 to 2006, across national data. And uh, three of these five solutions featured the condition of violent protest strategy. So we know that uh, defection can arise under nonviolent and violent circumstances. Um, my hypothesis for future inquiry is that it's probably a mixture of both that has the highest uh, likelihood of spurring the outcome. Uh, it seems to me that uh, in your study you have made a very, very interesting uh, 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 unpackaging of the concept of the uh, nonviolent uh, civic resistance by making a distinction between the strictly nonviolent uh, uh, civic resistance and uh, mass civic protests, which include elements of the, of the no unarmed uh, violence. Can I, you a little bit explain uh, us what is the differ difference and what is the specifically unarmed uh, violence? Sure. So fully nonviolent resistance um, is when no forms of violence are utilized at all. So not even like harmful blockades. This is essentially occupations and marches, sit-ins. Uh, in contrast to unarmed violence, unarmed violence can be what scholars refer to as sticks and stones, right? So there are some forms of violence, uh, but they're still unarmed, which brings us to the ultimate category of violent resistance where that has the featuring of guns and knives, explosives, etc. So in my research I emphasize that it's important to uh, specify which of these strategies are going on in a given campaign. And from my recent inquiry, I think that combinations of all of these strategies, of the, of the two, sorry, not all, but of unarmed violence and full nonviolence, the usage of both of those uh, I think may be the most historically effective in bringing about uh, major social change. And in your research, you have uh, uh, came with a certain percentages. Let's say mm -hmm. saying, let's say my data set is showing me that this amount of the purely nonviolent has been successful. This percentages of yeah. uh, so what, what are the percentages? Well, uh, this was from a, a study that uh, was published around a year ago. And I'll read it off here just because it's, yeah. it's a, a lot of percentages. And uh, it, was, it was data on revolutionary opposition movements from the year 1800 till the year 2006, so 206 years of opposition activity. And uh, I found that nonviolent campaigns were uh, successful 48% of the time. So uh, almost half. So fully nonviolent campaigns were 48% successful. Uh, campaigns that adopted unarmed violence were 61% successful, while fully violent campaigns were 30% successful. Mm -hmm. So those numbers um, contradict previous research, which basically said nonviolent campaigns were around 60% successful and violent campaigns were around 30, right? I included this additional measure of unarmed violence, and I found that that form of strategy is actually the most successful. Mm -hmm. There's different mechanisms uh, behind why uh, I think that may be so, but I won't get into them just now. In Myanmar, we have a, a very complex situation. Basically, uh, we have attempted military coup, which has not succeeded to consolidate the power. Uh, we have already prolonged eight months long, uh, very mass, very nationwide uh, uh, protest which uh, from the beginning during the first four months has been strictly nonviolent and this nonviolent movement is still continuing now in the eighth months but in meantime as a reaction of the of the on the violence of the military uh, people started also to apply the unarmed violent tactics and now in the last months also they started to resort to the armed armed resistance so it's a it's a very 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 complex uh, is there any similar uh, case somewhere else in the world uh, I, that's a fantastic question because you literally do have the whole portfolio of strategies here and uh, 
I think one important uh, element to consider here is that challenging a military-run government is different than a civilian-run uh, government. And with all these strategies being used, potentially the, the recent case of Sudan might be a parallel, but uh, to be honest, I'm not uh, an expert in, in that country. But from history, that's all I can really see, uh, in, in at least recent history. And again, challenging a military-led uh, government is different than a civilian because usually um, the civilian-led government uh, has to rely on a military to protect it, whereas now the military is the government, right? I mean, I know in, in, in the country under attention, there's uh, around eighty to 90,000 police officers as well, but the, the armed forces are, are huge, one of the, the largest armed forces in, in, in Asia, mm-hmm. right? like 300,000, 400,000 people. So that, that's a massive uh, structure of security. And... Uh... Uh, in your research, have you in any moment uh, um, analyzed uh, and uh, researched the kind of active tactics mm-hmm. which protest movements are doing uh, to basically uh, stimulate mm-hmm. uh, the loyalty shift of the security forces or the factions of the security forces? And you have, if you have done some research on that, let's say, what are the, the, the usual tactics in a repertoire? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, Beginning with one of the most historically prominent um, factors or processes, and this actually has not happened in Myanmar, but it is repression backfire. So in some uh, historical revolutions, the, a military would just massacre civilians, and after that, the government would just fall. Uh, people would get outraged, the military would stop doing their job, almost uh, more than a majority. Uh, but on a more pragmatic note, if you look to contexts such as Turkey or Myanmar, right, um, a, a repertoire would be simply fraternization, right? So protesters in their interactions with, with security forces will, would attempt to convince them to question their loyalty. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in some historical revolutions, like in Ukraine in 2003 or four, I believe, um, protesters and the opposition movement offered the military better working conditions and higher pay if they were to... Uh, end up overthrowing the government. And if there is a unified organizational structure in an opposition movement, which is hierarchical and there's um, leadership, the leadership can literally pose uh, programs to potential defectors and offer them protection. I think that already has happened in Myanmar. It happened in Iran in 1978 and 79. Uh, Opposition movements even, uh, the opposition movement back then even sheltered and led uh, security forces to escape uh, mm. provided them routes to do so. So there, there's a range of tactics. None of them are guaranteed to succeed and it is the job of uh, scholars to find out when and uh, why they are successful. And it's even more task of the people on the ground oh, in yeah. the process movement to invent yeah. uh, different things. Uh, uh, the next question is um, you know, your data set, if I'm right, uh, uh, which you have been using for your research has been going till the 2006. Uh, some of the, of the scholars uh, doing the similar research of the, of the defections in the army and nonviolent protests, let's say, have expanded it a little bit to 2014. Uh, my question is, uh, can we already now say that uh, after the 2010, after the 2011, or after the 2014, we have basically entered into the new uh, era almost, in which we have a very weak West, mm-hmm. we have a very, very assertive uh, 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 and opportunistic Putin, ready to support the regimes at any cost, We have a China uh, playing its global role in protecting the authoritarian regimes. We have a regional power like Saudi Arabia, Arabia, the Turkey, Mm -hmm. jumping into the geopolitical. And it seems that they are, let's say, all these kind of the geopolitical changings are also significantly changing the conditions in which uh, the protests are happening and the regimes are calculating, let's say, what are their their options. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think the the rise of a multipolar world order in the last 10 years has been incredibly significant for determining what happens on the ground in subnational contexts. Um, One major scholarly trend now is the topic of democratic backsliding. 
And this process, I think, has really picked up in the last 10 years. Countries that were ranked at a certain level in their democratic uh, institution functioning are tending to rank worse year in and year out. And combined with the rise of China and then the resurgence of uh, Russia, at least militarily, um, I think you do have a, a qualitatively different set of conditions in today's protest struggles than you did before. Uh, not only for these massive geopolitical shifts, but also in terms of communication technology and digital technology. When social media first uh, arose, there was a lot of scientific papers published that were quite idealist, saying that, well, protesters now uh, will be able to to utilize this and overthrow governments because they have such a powerful medium of communication. But as time has gone on, uh, I think governments have been more effective in, in shutting down communication through digital, digital technology than protesters have been in utilizing it to overthrow governments. And it's likely because governments control, uh, in most countries, electrical grids. They can create power outages. They can um, shut down the internet overnight. There are so many different strategies. So different era, different tools, and different uh, preferences. Uh, in, our, in our last uh I say a couple of years or maybe even a little bit longer, longer, we really had examples of the extraordinary strong uh, uh, civic resistance uh, popular movements. Uh, we can think about the case of the Venezuela, of the Turkey, of the Syria at the, at the beginning, or Hong Kong uh, more recently. And uh, in all these cases, uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, the regimes crack down, the protests in which kind of the hundreds of thousands, in some cases even millions of the people as a particip participated. So, so we might be needed to talk about certain additional resilience of the, of the regime. regimes. Do you have some explanations why the regimes are today more resilient than they seems that they used to be before? Yeah, thanks. It's a great question. It's one that's on the mind of many people, both activists and scholars, and I think if we situate it within this literature of democratic uh, backsliding and the rise of authoritarianism, uh, perhaps elites that are in control of governments are less likely to uh, give into con pro-democratic concessions than they were in the past. For example, in 1989 and uh, from 89 to 91, uh, in this part of the world, in anti-communist revolutions, many elites agreed to give concessions. For In countries like Hungary or uh, Bulgaria, they sat down at the table with the armed forces and the opposition. Mm -hmm. It was a change in their mind. So I think this anti-democratic mind shift that's, in, that's been going on in the last 10 or so years, and it continues to intensify, could be why governments are less likely to concede to pro-democratic opposition. But then there's also another explanation, and it, the answer probably lies somewhere in between. I also think that perhaps um, democracy and associated ideological platforms may have run their course, their historical course. We saw that with communism. Mm -hmm. Communism started to not be as popular. People stopped believing in it. Uh, perhaps opposition movements need to articulate a new ideological platform. We kind of already see that in, in, in places like Germany, where now there's like platforms of climate governance, and, and that's fundamentally different than what came before. Mm -hmm. So it could be the case that, again, one hand you have uh, elites less likely to offer concessions because they perceive that there's this anti-democratic global wave, they have support from big players like China and Russia, but then you also could have a deficiency mm -hmm. in the need for activists to articulate new ideological platforms. Mm -hmm. And I would uh, cite here Ernesto Laclau, who was a, a prominent discourse theorist, and he would always talk about um, the need to I, I articulate a new idea of a people and to include symbols in there to incorporate, like, for example, both intellectuals and the working class, that politics is not a static foundation, that a new form of hegemony needs to be uh, articulated in some historical periods. And mm -hmm. I think perhaps we are at that period. And uh, I don't want to end with this, but I want to say there's, a, there's no one that was more wrong than Fukuyama, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because it, what we've seen is that history has not ended. In, instead, it's just been reinvigorated. Mm -hmm. and would you kind of dare to, kind of, to think about following uh, lines that uh, one of the reasons why uh, authoritarian regimes might be more 
resilient in addition to all the things that you have mentioned is also that basically kind of the uh, what became politically and economically viable options for the regimes is these kind of oligarchic systems which are surrounded by the security apparatus and they don't need the people because they have this kleptocratic globalized world mm -hmm. in which they can they can let's say nicely prosper and have the resources and that this is basically let's say now their goals are no ideological yeah. anymore they don't need to care for yeah. the people because the globalized kleptocratic system is basically enabling them to have all the benefits and very little kind of the harm so is yeah. that overstretched from I, no no i think that that there is truth to to that observation um i think especially from an international development perspective, uh, the, the last 30 years, especially the 20 years, the rise of China has flipped economic theory upside down because it was never believed that an authoritarian state could achieve such high rates of economic growth and prosperity for such a large amount of time. Mm -hmm. So that's also in the mind of leaders that there's no like this Bretton Woods system of governance and these packet, these IMF and World Bank packages that have institutional changes attached to them countries are starting to realize, well, we don't need to make those changes. We can just have, for example, China come in and build our, our highways and develop in the Chinese model. Um, that's one aspect. Another aspect, and I think I'd, I'd cite here more of a, a literary or philosophical uh, theme, and if you uh, have ever read uh, Dostoevsky's Demons, which is a book about uh, revolution in, in 19th century Russia, and uh, there's an interesting set of statements in there, and, and he basically uh, postulated kind of an ontology of revolution that uh, if there's a decline in religion and people are not believing in uh, a theistic power, then they're going to try to make uh, a, uh, some kind of uh, godlike power on earth. Mm -hmm. And perhaps with the global decline of religion, and I'm just just saying, just talking mm -hmm. here, my subjective opinion, global decline in uh, theistic belief, especially in the West, uh, perhaps people are doing all they can to to create regimes on earth mm. and uh, shifting greater attention into preserving these regimes, even if they're autocratic. I mean, you look at places like North Korea uh, or even contemporary China, what what uh, difference is there in, you know, in, in the supreme leader uh, versus a, 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 a theistic deity? Mm. Very, very little. Uh, just for uh, with the two more questions uh, to come back, let's say to the question of the defections and and you are in the middle of the struggle, so basically your profound as a pro protest movement, uh, your profound aim is to stimulate the defection and to give in a certain way certain promises, certain concessions mm -hmm. in order to get the military on your side. Uh, in which way they can negatively influence your future prospects? Uh, to basically have a high quality democracy or not to have let's say military or security forces back after a couple of couple of years so so can you elaborate a little bit about that how much you lose yeah. your future quality of the democracy if you are making a promises and bringing military during the struggle on your side sure i think it has to do with institutions and the institutional configurations that get set up uh, all about taxation if there's resource wealth which we know in uh, myanmar there's immense natural mm -hmm. resources if that issue is not dealt with meaning that if those security forces in the future uh, rely on some kind of external form of income or the, or that their income is being driven by non-taxable forms mm -hmm. then that relationship between them and the people is likelier to deteriorate because their their preferences aren't aligned. Mm. Uh, it's an institutional configuration that needs to re, it needs to result in equilibrium. Mm. In in seventeenth century England, which was a context uh, where you had the first country and having a king loses divine right to rule. Uh, there you had a king uh, secede power, to partial power to a parliament, and that parliament started taxing people. And that's a very important dynamic because revenue, governmental revenue would then be based on taxation and security forces would get taxed. But again, each case needs to be qualitatively researched. Uh, you need to know where uh, armed forces are getting paid from. Mm -hmm. I know that something we haven't mentioned, I mean, we talked about China and Russia, but from my understanding, um, China, both China and Russia have a big arms deals contract with, with the Myanmar uh, army. Mm 
Yeah, they have, they have, or, or Russia less, let's say Russia is now, let's say, entering into the, mm -hmm. into the field, using the opportunity. Uh, China is playing much more, much more complex, complex yeah. uh, game, let's say, because they don't want instability, yeah. they don't want also to have a soft power influence, mm -hmm. so they don't want fully to back the, the coup, but on the other side they are afraid of the people's power, so, so China is playing a very, very complicated role. Uh, I know that uh, the scholars uh, don't like to make the predictions, they like to make analysis based on, a, on, a, on a things what happen and the data and facts which they have. But still, let me uh, ask you the question, uh, what you would say, what are the three uh, do it for the protest movement which is facing the uh, military regime and trying to uh, stimulate the defections? What are the three things to do, and what are the three no nos? Don't do that ever. Well, it sounds like I need to write a paper yeah. about that because it's something I I uh, don't really I can't answer off the top of my head, but I'll do my best. Uh, the three things that need to be done first: the opposition needs to have an organizational structure, preferably hierarchical, with a certain set of leaders that can at any time become the leader of the movement. That leader needs to be good at negotiating. It needs to essentially be a populist figure. Uh, a second thing would be, again, to make uh, guarantees to the potential defectors of a better life after, after a revolution. And a third uh, dynamic would be addressing the topic of, of pay and the institutional structure behind how armed forces get paid if there is to be a new government. Uh, three no-nos. Uh, <laughs> The really, really difficult here. I think, again, having a non-hierarchical movement in which there's no particular leader will be at, put you in a disadvantage because it'll be harder to come up with deals and programs. Uh, you have to have significant political actors that are willing to, to essentially put their lives on the risk, uh, put their lives at risk. Uh, another uh, dynamic would be to, to not um, directly engage in, in conflict in early stages of the movement, right? Mm -hmm. You, you want to kind of try different things and see how the situation uh, pans out. And the third and final factor, again, would be don't rely, um, don't always rely on external international communities because we've seen many instances where the international community does support a movement, for example, Venezuela, but it may not result in success. Mm -hmm. So be open-minded and uh, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's not, not much else to say. Yeah. It's a difficult question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think like, some of the things what you responded is really kind of in a certain way very, very relevant, relevant for, for colleagues in Myanmar. Maybe just one additional kind of sub-question is uh, you have mentioned kind of the giving the promises, giving the incentives to the to the military. Uh, uh, on the other side, let's say when you are in the middle of the struggle, struggle and that military is committing uh, atrocities against yeah. the civilian population, so so it's a politically very very hard to sure. make uh, the promises in a moment. Let's say when your people want yeah. them to be punished. Let's say, do you have any ideas how to balance yeah. uh, these two things? I think it would it would have to do with discourse and ideas about morality because if if an opposition movement is to articulate a new form of hegemony uh, like Ernesto Laclau uh, frequently talked about it would need to feature s some kind of ideas about the people if if the incumbent government or security forces are uh, slaughtering and massacring people there's an issue about what they perceive to be the people and I'm not saying that new ideas from the opposition could change that, but it would be a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, some kind of moral dynamic would have to come into play. And I know that uh, morality is, is more of a political philosophy concept that's talked about in normative ways mm -hmm. in scholar, scholarship, but it is, I think, empirically in the real world, it is very important. Mm -hmm. um, th there has to be a line drawn about shared meanings understandings, uh, historical legacies, uh, what's right and what's wrong. Uh, Alexei, it has been a real uh, uh, pleasure to, to talk uh, with you. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I think my audience uh, will learn a lot. So it was really a very big pleasure. Thank you very much for, for uh, giving Thank us the time. Much.